Hey there, my name is Carlos Salguero. I am originally from Quito, Ecuador, and this is the story of how I became a millionaire by age 29. So originally I came from Quito, Ecuador. I was born and raised over there. My parents were from Ecuador. No one in our family had come to the United States other than friends and relatives, maybe from extended family that had made it over here. Some of them had traveled, some of them had come back. And one of the things that in our family, ever since I was a child, was very very, very obvious is, hey, maybe there's a chance for you guys to go study abroad. That was the goal. The goal was for us to come and study here, not necessarily for us to come and relocate to this country and live here. And I'm going to tell you the story exactly how that happened. I came to the U.S. at 17. I graduated from college, got a couple degrees, went on to work for a big corporation. And then I started a business out of necessity because I wanted a side income. And I was never thinking I'm going to become a millionaire. I was thinking I want some financial freedom. So this is exactly how I did it. When I was thinking about coming to the U.S., one of the big things that influenced that decision is that we were in an American school. We went to a bilingual school in Ecuador. My mom especially had a lot of influence in that she wanted us to learn a second language. We were originally going to go to a German school. She went to a German school when she was a kid, learn German, learn, learn English. So she saw the value of learning more than one language. My dad was more the very disciplinarian of oh, this kid kids need to go to the military school because he had been in the military and uh, it was by a hair that we didn't end up in military school and my mom actually pursued for us to go into the American school. So that was a very wise decision from their part. Eternally grateful for that influence because we learned in a bilingual education system. We had classes that were half in English, half in Spanish. So if you have a chance to learn a second language, if you still want to, it's always a good idea. But if you have kids, it is a great idea for them to be bilingual. I think I was one of the things that helped me a lot because it would have been a lot harder for me to arrive to the U.S., have to learn English from scratch. Like my English wasn't perfect when I arrived, but having to learn English from scratch would have probably delayed my goals a lot further. So uh, when I was in Ecuador, you know, my goal was to one day come to the U.S., maybe study abroad. And we started talking about that ever since I was probably 12 or 13, where my dad had seen other people come to the U.S. and send their kids to study in the U.S. So a big goal that my parents had is like, maybe we can send our kids to study in the U.S. And for me, that goal came at around 17 years old. And by the way, I went to Mexico first to go to my first year of college there. And in Mexico, I realized that I wanted to try it out, right? I wanted to be away from home and my parents obviously wanted me to uh, try studying somewhere else. But the goal for me was like, hey, maybe I can go to the U.S. And it was a big jump because we had no family. There was no connections here. I had limited amount of money. Colleges in the U.S. are very expensive for international students. Tuition is about 3x of what a resident person will pay here in college tuition. So my parents put together some money and I applied to some colleges in Colorado that were inexpensive. I couldn't go to my dream college, which at the time was CU Boulder because that school was very expensive. I had to settle for Colorado State University Pueblo, which is uh, further away and it's a much smaller school. But you know what? That was an opportunity and it was a chance. So I took it and I can tell you when I came and arrived in Pueblo, Colorado, which is a very small town, which is very good for studying, not so much for socializing and building a good network. What I was feeling was like, man, what have I done? This is hard because I was used to live at home in a family home, have dinner with my parents every night, have, you know, see them every day, see my brother and sister every day. And uh, uh, that disconnect was tough. The first two years were the hardest because I was thinking about home every single day. But you know what? One of the sacrifices that I had to make is I was thinking, hey, you know, this is a great opportunity. I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let my parents down. And even though I thought about quitting a thousand times during my college years, I resisted the urge of saying, hey, this is enough. I don't want to do it. And in the first two years was also where I had to catch up to the English skills, to the writing, to the speaking, to the math skills, because the first two years of college were a lot of math where a lot of English, a lot of writing, and uh, I wasn't necessarily too fond of writing and reading a lot in those years. Like I would pick up a book and read it, but it was not my favorite thing to write a whole lot of English stuff. In fact, that was probably the biggest struggle that I had is the English writing. The math didn't come easy, but I could do it and uh, it was it was tough. Now, here's 
first one of the biggest challenges that we had in college is that we would run out of money. Like the money that my parents would give didn't last for everything. So I had to figure out how to get more than one job while I was in college. I did catering, food service, uh, we did landscaping. I was then working in the international studies program as a volunteer first until I got hired. I did a lot of free stuff so that I could get my foot in the door to then maybe get a job. And uh, eventually I was making enough money to buy my first vehicle. It was a very small, old uh, four wheel drive vehicle. And uh, I was super proud of myself because it was the first car that I ever bought with my own money. And uh, I can't even remember how much I paid for it, probably two, three thousand dollars. And they did the job, right? It wasn't fancy. It wasn't a, it wasn't something you look at and say, man, this car is great. But to me, it was a win. It was a, it was a victory, right? This little Jeep four wheel drive car, good for the snow, right? I wanted something good for the snow. And uh, it just was one of the things that I had is like, and all along the way, what I was thinking is like, guys, my parents are making all these sacrifices for me to be in this country. I want one day to be able to say, hey guys, I don't need your money anymore. Like that was my whole goal. And that happened about halfway into college. About halfway into college, I was making enough money with, with my jobs and some sales that I did. I started selling printing to the school. My dad was a printer back at home. So I figured out a way to start some sort of a, of a, of a gig of flipping the stuff that my dad was printing at home and sell it to the college and pay for my school that way. So I was always very creative and trying to figure out a solution, right? I think one, one of the big contributing factors of me becoming financially free and a millionaire by 29 was I was always looking for, hey, how do I make this work? How do I make some money out of this? How do I create something? And I tried a ton of things, guys. I tried a lot of multi-level marketing businesses. I tried to sell different things. So it was it was always on the lookout. And you know, all the while without without stopping my studies. I graduated from school. It took me five years to get two degrees. More people, most people take seven years to get two degrees. I finished my undergrad in three and a half years. And then I did my master's in a year and a half because I was taking double the course load than everybody else. And more than me trying to be super ambitious, it was a, it's a money saving technique, right? Because I figured out that if I would take more credits in one semester, it would cost me about 25% less than me having to take the course in the next semester. So I kind of stack things up. So I had a full-time education plus some, and I had a full-time job on top of that. And sometimes I had full-time job plus part-time job. So I am not going to tell you it was easy. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of grind, but I was young. You know, I was young. I didn't need much sleep and I was very focused and obsessed to get these degrees. Once I got the degrees, I truly thought that I was going to go back and help my dad run his business. And when I called him and said, Hey dad, I'm going to, I'm going to go help you with, the, with your business. He said, no son, I think it's best if you stay over there. I think I'm going to retire in a year or two. So that to me was kind of a mixed, mixed message from him because all along thought, hey, I'm getting a good education. I'm going to go blow up his business is already in existence. But I think for him, it was more important for us to build a life here. And now I'm super thankful that he did that, even though at the time I felt super bad. I was like, my dad just rejected me from uh, going and running his business. Because a lot of the kids that also from my school came to the US, graduated and went back, did that. And uh, so I thought I was gonna do that, but I'm glad he didn't do it. And I was forced then to figure out a way to stay here because I had a student visa. That was another key thing. I had a student visa that only allowed me to be here if I was a student. Once I graduated, I needed to go find a job that would sponsor me for a visa so that I could have a work visa. So I went knocking doors. I applied to a lot of companies. I flew to interviews in places that I didn't want to live in. I remember going into Saginaw, Michigan to an automotive company there and getting the job offer. And I'm like looking at the job offers like, you know what? I don't live. I don't want to live in Michigan. It's cold. And I ended up finding an opportunity in California and I, I, I I became uh, an engineer at Hewlett Packard. In the beginning, it was a free gig. They wouldn't hire me because I didn't have experience. So I said, hey, would you take me as an intern? Can I learn and can I give you my time free? And they accepted. And a few months later, they actually hired me as an engineer, paid engineer. I was giving everything I got, right? I was there early, I was leaving late. Uh, some of the things that I think helped me early on in my job success is that I've never been the guy that just does what's expected. I've always been the guy that does more than what's expected, deliver more than what's expected. And uh, if you do that, 
if you're always thinking, hey, how can I give more? How can I do the extra? How can I do one more rep, one more mile, one more iteration? It ends up compounding over time and it gives you just so much more momentum than other people. So that's one of the things that I was always thinking about is like, hey, how can I do more? How can I gain an edge? How can I grow? I don't know exactly where I picked up that. I was probably sometime when I was working for my dad when I was a kid, when I saw my mom making phone calls late at night to clients. Uh, like, like there was, there was no set schedule. Like I think I grew up in an environment at home where my dad would leave super early. He will come to lunch, have quick lunch with my mom and, and us when we come back from school and then go back to the office. And then sometimes he will come back at six. Sometimes he will come back at eight. Sometimes it will be nine o'clock. Sometimes he would stay in the office till midnight, till two in the morning because they had to work extra time to fulfill a job that he had. So I think I was watching this and to me, the nine to five never was the nine to five. Like, everybody else was leaving I'm like why are they leaving I still have a lot of work to do let me finish my work right so so it was it was more of a to me the the the, the traditional office schedule was just a suggestion rather than oh yeah man I, I need to clock out and uh, yeah I got in trouble a couple times at my job because I was racking up some overtime and they're like hey you can't you can't rack overtime like why are you staying so late and I'm like because I'm still trying to finish my project and they're like well if you do we can't pay I was like okay I still need to finish my project so, you know, the money was good, but but I was like, I was I was more results driven rather than money driven. Like for, for the longest time, for me, the wins came not from making the extra thousand bucks from the overtime pay. It came from, I got done with my project. I got done with this thing that I set out to do. That was my result. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes holds back a lot of people is they're not results driven. They're time driven. They're like, oh, I've put 12 hours of work. I've worked seven days a week, right? When and time could be irrelevant. Like you could be working seven days a week for months on end, but if you don't get results, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. Because as an entrepreneur, eventually you're, you're not trading time for dollars anymore. When you're in a job and I was in that job, so I was treating that job almost like it was my own business because I wouldn't care about starting time, ending time, uh, PTO, right? I, like I had to be explained, hey Carlos, when you, when, when you leave, you're actually gonna get paid when you're on vacation. I was like, really? That's cool, I didn't think so. So that's cool. So these are some of the things that I adopted. So what, what ended up happening is when the economy changed back in 2001, the dot-com bubble in Silicon Valley hit. A lot of the startup companies went out of business. I had offers from startup companies that I didn't take because I was scared. It was a lot of money. It was stock options. They promised the moon and the stars. And I was like, you know what? I'm just beginning my journey. Why don't I stay with a bigger company that offers me a little bit more safety? And I'm glad I did that because I would probably ended up being displaced or, or out of a job very quickly when the dot-com bubble burst because all those startups went out of business. And the big companies even, the Hewlett Packers of the world, which is the company I was working for, started shrinking. So I saw a lot of opportunity for vertical growth because they didn't hire back the people that left. So I grew to a manager real fast. But the recession in those day, in those, in those years lasted two, three years. So even though I had a lot of opportunity going up, then they started firing people. Then they made me fire people. That was one of the hardest things I ever had to do is fire a bunch of engineers in my group. And I was like disappointed. I was mad at myself. How do I put myself in this position? I didn't want ever anyone else in my life to tell me, hey, you got to fire these people because the company's not doing well. Like that thing just rubbed me the wrong way completely. And I know that if you're watching this and you've had to fire people, it's never a fun situation, no matter what. Like if it's performance based, it's probably a little easier. But when it's just simply economy and driven by layoffs and, and just the economy not doing well and the company not doing well as a result, it sucks. And that's one of the things that marked me early on where I vowed to myself, hey, I'm never going to be put in this position. And guess what? Just a few months later, I was the one on the receiving end of that. I was the one laid off. I was the one that was kicked out. And here's what happened. I had to figure out a way to make money. And I went for a little period of time where I didn't know how to make money. But even while I was with my job, I was testing a lot of stuff. And one of the things that I was testing 
is how to sell online, how to sell on eBay, how to do e-commerce. So I went full force, doubled down on e-commerce, and that's when I started seeing some results. Like I was doing part-time e-commerce when I was with a company. I started doing full-time e-commerce and I started seeing money coming in. And e-commerce was this new trending thing that was growing. A lot of people didn't believe in it. A lot of people criticized me. A lot of the engineers that I knew from the job said, no, you're gonna be back. You're probably gonna be at a job in just a few months from now. And you know, maybe that made me angry. That made me angry enough to go try it even harder to learn it, to master it. Back in those days, there was no mentorships, no YouTube, nothing I could learn. So I had to learn from scratch. I had to just trial and error, invest my money, max out my credit cards, buy inventory that sometimes sold for a profit, sometimes sold for a loss. A lot of trial and error in those early years. But you know what? I was working around the clock, nights, weekends, every single minute of the day. And every penny that I made was reinvested in the business. And I went for a period of a good three to five years where every single penny was reinvested in the business. I think that is very key. A lot of people get excited because they make their first $10,000 of profit, $20,000 of profit, $50,000 of profit. And instead of feeding the beast, feeding the baby business that you're building, they go and buy a car, they go and buy a house. And now their business is starving for more because in the beginning, a newborn business needs a lot of money, a lot of investment, and you're still learning how to do it. So I reinvested every penny I had. I started learning how to hire people. I started delegating my things that we're doing that were very labor intensive, like shipping orders and doing customer service emails and all that stuff that my business required. I started delegating those. I started hiring family members. I hired people that were very close to me and I started hiring strangers. Had a hard time hiring strangers because I didn't know how to do it. So I had to learn how to hire and how to fire. But eventually the business started doing really well. And then we went from a garage where we were building the business and a basement, we went and grew into an office, into a larger office and into a warehouse. And I started learning how to rent a warehouse. And this is when I started making good money. And by the time I was 29 years old, my business was making multiple millions of dollars a year in sales. And I was starting to keep a good portion of that. And that's when, even as a millionaire at 29 years old, I kept my lifestyle very frugal, lived way below my means, we were still living in a townhome. My wife and I, I met my wife along the way. She helped me a ton in the early years as well. She supported me a lot, believed in me, gave me the space to go continue to do what I was doing. And uh, we still lived in a little townhome. So here we are, millionaires in business, still living in a townhome. And that's really, for me, becoming a millionaire was not the pinnacle. It was never the objective, by the way. The objective was financial freedom, financial liberty, financial pay, getting everything paid and not worry. Like my goal wasn't to have a million dollars in the bank. My goal was to never worry about the cable bill, about the electric bill, about the rent, about the mortgage, about the car payment. Like, like I didn't want to have mental space for those things. I wanted to know every single month that those things were fully taken care of and that money was rolling in in plenty amounts to take care of those things. That was what I wanted. So maybe you're after becoming a millionaire like I did at 29, but what I was after was kind of have all my bills paid and still have some money left to go do some fun stuff. Even if that's once a week, that was it. And then just compound on that. So that's the story of how I became a millionaire by 29 years old. It was that long journey. In my eyes, it was longer than I thought I was. But now that I think about it, if I barely graduated college at 24 and I was a millionaire already at 29, that's roughly a six year journey from college student fresh out of college to million dollars. And I think that everybody can do it. I think it took me a long time with the technology that exists today, the learning, the knowledge, you can do it too. If you just stick with it, I think you can do it in three to five years. It's not gonna be easy, but just keep learning, keep acquiring knowledge. But more importantly, one thing that I did over and over again is massive action, massive action, massive action. So if you're wondering how to be done, I encourage you come and join me in my Infinite Cashflow show every single Wednesday, where I teach you how to become a millionaire, how to invest in real estate, how to work with money, how to learn money, how to invest. Hit the subscribe button and join me in the next one. Thanks for watching.